WDBM East Lansing. Welcome to The Sci Files, an Impact 89 FM series focusing on student research here at Michigan State University. We're your co hosts, Chelsea Boodoo and Daniel Puentes. Today we welcome Nick Jaffe. Can you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, I'm Nick Jaffe. I'm a PhD student in fisheries and wildlife, and I study gray wolf ecology and movement in Michigan. Specifically, we're trying to understand how wolves may recolonize Michigan, northern lower Michigan, and how that will affect both the local ecosystems and how it will affect people, especially economically. What is the current status of conservation efforts for gray wolves right now? Have they been nearly extinct, or what's the purpose? So gray wolves were basically extirpated or wiped out from Michigan in the early 1900s and from most of the United States, in fact. The only place in the lower 48 where they were left by the 1970s was in northeastern Minnesota. Precisely around that time, they passed the Endangered Species Act, and wolves were effectively protected for the first time ever in the history of the U.S. And wolves are a really versatile a species, so they actually recovered very successfully to the point where now we have fairly large populations in the Mountain West and in the northern Great Lakes region, so in Minnesota and Wisconsin and Michigan. And in Michigan, we have currently around 650 individuals all in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So 650 total gray wolves in the Upper Peninsula. In Michigan, yeah. And probably around 4,000 in the Great Lakes region. About a 900 or so in Wisconsin and several thousand in Minnesota. How do you know that there's 650 wolves in Michigan? Do you all go out and tag them or is there like satellite imagery or something? So we don't know that it's exactly 650. That's obviously an estimate, but the DNR, so the Department of Natural Resources in Michigan, has had a monitoring program for wolves since they returned in the early 90s. And in the very beginning, there were so few wolves that they could actually count exactly how many there were. They would use snow track surveys, so they'd go out in wintertime when the adults are moving around and all the pups are now big enough that they're moving with the pack. So you could get an actual number of how many adults there were by finding the tracks, and then you follow them, and you see how how many times they split, right? So if they're following each other in a line, eventually they'll split, and you can see, oh, there were three here. And then they do that for all these different regions in the UP, in the Upper Peninsula, and account for neighboring packs, and they would come up with a number. More recently, there are so many now that they can't do that anymore. So they have, they still do the track surveys, and they use a model to kind of account for uncertainty year to year of how many there may be. But generally for the last five years, it's been between 600 to 650. Recently in the East Lansing area and other areas of southern Michigan, there have been worries about coyotes moving into domesticated areas that people live in. But something that I think would be really helpful for our audience is, could you describe what the difference is between a gray wolf and a coyote? So... Gray wolves and coyotes are very closely related to the point where they can actually interbreed with each other. The main differences between a wolf and a coyote are are very simply size and how they behave, how their life history is. So wolves are the dominant predator on the landscape, and they're considerably bigger than coyotes. So a good example would be when I, I got the privilege to go up with the DNR and do some of the track surveys with them, and they showed me, I had never seen a wolf or tracked wolves at that point, and they showed me a wolf print compared to a coyote print, and the wolf print was probably the roughly the size of my hand. It's just a massive print, and a coyote was about half that size. And I asked them, how do you know it's not a a wolf pup? And they said, even the wolf pups have paws that big. They're just considerably larger than the coyote. And in systems where coyotes and wolves live together, they play very different roles. Wolves will actually kill coyotes if they find them because they see them as like a nuisance or, or a rival. 
So coyotes kind of tend to focus more on eating smaller animals, and wolves are sort of the dominant predator that'll go for the larger prey. I think it's really interesting to note that there has been a growth in the population of the gray wolves within Michigan and across America, across the Great Lakes region. This kind of reminds me of an episode we once had about African carnivores and how they were interacting with the villagers and the people of the community. How are the people of Michigan or of the Great Lakes area taking this expulsion of the population? Like, are they perceiving it well? I I would imagine that people might be afraid of these great wolves being around here. So wolves are a very iconic species. Obviously, everyone from the age of like three knows what a wolf is. And depending on where you grow up, you tend to have a lot of associations with them, a lot of which are cultural and been passed down over time. So it depends who you ask. Generally, if you live in a city, people are very excited to have wolves because they see wolves as like this beacon of nature and natural balance. And this means when I go to a national park, maybe I'll see a wolf. And it's very exciting. And there's a lot of support for them. Folks who live more in the rural countryside are less friendly, though this is obviously they're not a mon. No one's a monolith, but the tendency is to be less friendly to wolves because usually at that point you interact with wolves more on a daily basis or on a more on a regular basis. So, for example, if you are a rancher, you know there are wolves in the area. You become highly concerned for your livestock. You think there's a new the top predator has returned to the landscape, and you look at your cattle or your sheep or whatever you have, and you think. That's an easy meal for a wolf. What's going to stop it from taking my livestock? And what's more, it's a protected species. There's nothing I can do about it. And then that kind of folds in with other kind of tensions that exist in rural communities where it's like they feel maybe like the government is imposing things on them. So they're imposing these wolves and they're not letting me manage my land and protect my animals or my livelihood. And so communities like that are far more resentful of wolves and there's more tension there and conflict there. And then there's a lot of folks who are somewhere in between. So like hunting communities tend to be kind of more ambiguous in how they feel about wolves because on the one hand, they you can kind of respect the animal and some people maybe even want to, to have it as a hunting item. But at the same time, Folks who, like here in Michigan, where there's a huge culture of deer hunting, they a lot of people worry that if wolves return, they're going to decimate the deer population. Whether that's accurate or not, that's the fear. And so they think, we don't want wolves because then I can't go out and hunt deer like I have with my dad and my grandfather for for years, right? That will be taken away. And so it's... There's a lot of conflict and a lot of controversy pretty much wherever wolves go, whether it's in Michigan or in Europe or anywhere else. It tends to be the same story of folks who live out in the countryside or tend to be anti-wolf, and the further away you get from it, the more pro-wolf it becomes. Another example of like kind of direct conflict with wolves is a lot of people who take hunting dogs out that tends to trigger the same response wolves have towards coyotes, where they think, ah, there's a nuisance, and I really want to attack and kill this dog. And so there's a lot of conflict that comes from people who either have hunting dogs and encounter wolves, or people who live in a wolf-populated area and their pet dogs may be attacked by wolves. So that's another, another source of tension. And some people also believe that wolves are in general, uh, a threat to human safety. Well, this is just another example of how there's always two sides to the same coin, right? But I think that hunter perspective that you bring up is interesting because at the same time, the DNR has also witnessed a major decline in the number of hunters that are coming out each season. So I wonder how that opinion will change as the number of hunters goes down unless there's a new resurgence of more hunting. But 
All of this is related, however, to how these wolves are moving. And this got me thinking about how your research is trying to model how these wolves are moving in the different environments that they exist in. And I wonder, what theoretical models are you using to simulate these gray wolf movements through the state of Michigan? So we're taking what's called an agent-based modeling approach. And that is essentially we try to recreate an environment digitally. So we create a digital map of Michigan that is comprised of many different things. It became, it's comprised of like prey density and snow depth and presence of people. And on this digital map, we populated it with our quote unquote agents, which are units that move autonomously or on their own and make all their own decisions. It's kind of like a video game, like the game Sims, or you can even think of like each agent being like the old Pokemon, like Game Boy games, where it's like just moving through the grass and through different systems and you have different interactions with the digital environment. We create that, but our digital environment is Michigan and our agents are wolves. And we let whatever patterns emerge from that inform our, our theories of how wolves may recolonize an area. So you're looking at the recolonization of these gray wolves, and I'm wondering how much more space is there for them to recolonize? Like, are they eventually going to be a certain population where they won't be protected anymore, where there's so many wolves that it might be too many? So regarding how much space there is left, um, the population in the UP, it seems like, this is about as many as we're going to get. It seems like the population has somewhat stabilized. So this suggests that the environment is saturated. It can't fit anymore. That doesn't mean it's going to stop wolves from expanding further. And wolves are extremely capable of getting to new areas. They have, in fact, gotten to northern lower Michigan before. Individual wolves have by crossing that frozen ice during wintertime. So that's where we'd expect the next expansion of wolves to occur from Michigan is if you have enough wolves, just like a mated pair, disperse across and establish a territory, there's an entire landscape in northern lower Michigan that has a lot more deer than the UP and has no wolves to compete with them. That is a potentially very highly suitable area for a new wolf population. As far as wolves endangered status, it has actually been going back and forth. It's been a bit of a legal battle because wolves have reached what they what they call the minimum sustainable population. So that was the goal of the wolf management plan for Michigan is to have 200 wolves. So they've far exceeded that. And a lot of people who are pro wolf management are saying, "All right, now it's time to manage the wolves, to harvest them, to hunt them." whatever your approach is, other folks are saying they still need to be protected because the Endangered Species Act says if a species is not recovered until it's returned to its native range, which is the entire U.S. So there's a bit of a legal battle that goes back and forth, and it changes year to year. So it's really up in the air as to how what protected status wolves will have if and when they make it across. It's really great to hear from another sci filer that joins us on our show today that talks to us about agent-based modeling. And you mentioned a couple of different categories on which you base the movement of these wolves, including snow depth. And that got me also thinking about how does the movements of these wolves change as the seasons progress throughout the year? So wolves are a generalist species. So they're the only things that truly affect their movement are where there are people and where there are prey. They want to get to the prey. People are, are an inhibition to that or a threat to their, to their life. Winter really affects wolf uh, hunting success. So when there is cold weather and deep snow and late snow, so late almost getting towards spring, that tends to make deer, which are the wolf's main prey, very weak and very vulnerable. So wolves actually have their most successful hunting periods in wintertime. And then they tend to supplement the, the rest of the year 
using other prey in addition to deer. So there's that effect and also the effect that during severe winters, deer often migrate to different habitat. And so wolves will need to follow them during winter time. It makes sense that the wolves are following the deer because that's their main source of food. But I would imagine that they have other sources of food as well. Something that I had read months ago at this point is that they had relocated some wolves to Isle Royale to help with the moose population. Would you be able to talk about the relocation of the wolves with Isle Royale in regards to the moose? Isle Royale is a really famous um, example of how wolves affect ecosystems. So Isle Royale had a really large population of moose that was just exploding in number, and then uh, wolves arrived and they began to affect the moose by hunting them in wintertime and therefore kind of managing the population. And as wolf population numbers decreased in the island due to inbreeding, the moose population began to skyrocket. And that has a whole bunch of problems down the line because they begin to eat all the vegetation and then you can imagine the effects that that has on the rest of the ecosystem. So the National Park Service has worked to bring new wolves in to Isle Royale to return that system because there were only two wolves left and they were bound to die out. And right now, I believe they have about 15 new wolves on the island and they're watching to see if the system begins to return to its original place. You mentioned how gray wolves being introduced on the island have served as a managerial status for the growing populations of the moose there. And I wonder, what other positive benefits do gray wolves have to managing the environment? The principal role of gray wolves is in that role of a top predator. And that the direct effects of that is reducing the numbers of their primary prey, which in this case would be deer, but also affecting their behavior. So a problem of having too many deer or too many moose or what have you is that they begin to eat everything. And that has big problems for the environment and for an ecosystem to function naturally. So introducing wool or wool's returning to a system can begin to improve on those effects because they force, they, even if they don't directly reduce the number of deer, they force deer to move around. Deer can no longer sit on a patch of grass and eat it until it's completely gone. They can eat for a few minutes, they need to look up, they need to check around them, they keep moving. And that is the primary benefit of, of the wolf is the behavioral changes that they have on their prey. I think this is a really interesting topic, Nick. I just want to reiterate for the people who might now be tuning in, but what are the goals of your research? So the goals of our research is to kind of give uh, people a roadmap to how wolves may recolonize an area. Because they bring such controversy with them, once wolves have arrived or once they exist somewhere in large numbers, people get so polarized and so stuck in their position that they, it's very difficult to reach an agreement on how to manage these, uh, these populations. And then it becomes a conflict that can reach really high levels of politics even. So our goal is to give people an approach and a tool that can tell them how many wolves can exist on a landscape, where in the landscape they can exist, and how quickly they can get there and also provide them with a measure of what those impacts may be so that you can sit pro-wolf people, anti-wolf people, you know, government managers who are maybe in the middle at a table and say, this is kind of what the forecast is looking like. This is what may happen. How can we all reach an agreement on how to move forward if this is the event that occurs? And hopefully people are kind of level-headed without the situation already existing in their backyard. And by maximizing the capabilities of your agent-based modeling, it sounds like it's going to be able to perform just that task. Yeah. Our, so we've been testing our model first on the Upper Peninsula. So we simulate it and compare it to how wolves historically recolonized the Upper Peninsula. And right now it matches up pretty, pretty well. Um, at the regional level. We're trying to fine-tune it so that I can even predict down to like the county scale 
But right now, the trend lines for our model and the trend line for the wolves historically are pretty much in sync. And so we're very hopeful that the tool can continue to be fine-tuned to a point where maybe it's even applicable beyond Michigan and to other regions. I would imagine there would have to be so many parameters that you would have to change, especially even just between Michigan with the Upper Peninsula and the Lower Peninsula, because the Upper Peninsula has a less population of humans versus the Lower Peninsula, which has a lot more people. Would you be taking into account like roads and how many people are actually in the Lower Peninsula and then the amount of animals that were, there would be around over here, like the deer population? That's exactly what we're looking at. Roads are actually an excellent tool because they're kind of a catch-all for human presence. And there's been a lot of research done out of Wisconsin with Wisconsin wolf packs that shows at broad scales, wolves will pick first regions that have very low road density, and they will continue to expand outwards from those. And obviously, wolves tend to do better in areas with higher prey densities, and we're also accounting for those with our own approaches to estimating them. When you first started this project, have there been any challenges or pitfalls that you didn't account for that now have to be taken into account to model the, this gray wolf movement appropriately? One of the challenges has been the role of winter because we're right on that edge where winter begins to affect the prey and that obviously affects wolves in turn. This is getting to the northern extremes of where deer can survive. And so trying to account for things like how deer move and migrate during winter time and how wolves will have to adjust to that has been a major challenge. That's pretty interesting. Back to your agent-based modeling, how do your agents move on the landscape within the model? So the goal in how we designed the agents is just to replicate wolf life history. So every agent Every wolf agent begins as a lone wolf, and they're exploring the landscape, trying to find a mate. That's goal number one. They find another agent who's of the opposite sex and who's not related to them, and they pair up. Wolves tend to pair up pretty quickly and pretty effectively. And then this pair moves together, and they find a territory, so an area with very few people and a pretty decent amount of prey. And they make a territory of a certain size, and they protect it from other wolves. And from within that territory, they eventually breed, and then pups grow and mature, and they pulse out of this territory back across the landscape. So over time, and then the whole cycle re repeats itself. And so over time, you have these territories pulsing out new wolves who form new territories, and the population begins to merge on the landscape. I think it's incredible that you're able to model these different types of behaviors of these wolves through your agent-based modeling. And I think that the way that you described it was pretty easy, I think, for anybody listening in to visualize it in their minds, how these pulses occur within the actual agent-based modeling of the pups being moving into different territories. But it I wonder, what motivated you to actually get involved with this research? Why did you choose to pursue it? Weirdly enough, I had never done anything with wolves until I got here. I actually studied birds for my master's, and before that I'd only really worked with fish and a little bit of amphibian stuff. But I was really, I was really drawn to the idea of tackling kind of a major conservation issue, especially one as controversial as wolves. I never thought I'd get it, but I applied anyway. And it turns out, because of the nature of the controversy that everyone has such a strong opinion on wolves, I was a very good candidate because I had no opinion on it whatsoever. I, I thought wolves were very interesting, but I wasn't very pro or anti how to manage them. And so they took me on, and I was just really drawn to uh, the sort of how do we present this conflict in a way that everyone can sit down and discuss in sort of a calm fashion. So if you can approach people and have a map and say, this is what may happen. This is how it may affect the deer. This is how it may affect people who rely on deer. It hasn't happened yet. We can all agree on a plan to address this and to be ready for it so that we don't descend into a conflict and a fight. 
And I think ultimately that's the goal of every conservationist is to try and get people to work together to allow for coexistence between society and nature and to get all the positive benefits that nature gives us without negatively affecting people. Thank you so much for joining us this morning to talk to us about your research on how agent-based modeling could model uh, wolf movements throughout the state of Michigan. Thank you for having me. Hey, do you want to drink some beer brewed by scientists while playing arcade games? Then join us at the first anniversary of the Sci-Files at the Grid on Pi Day. At 6 p.m., we will be releasing a beer brewed at Sagatug Brewery called Diceros. The proceeds go to the black rhino mother, Dopsy, and her calf, Jali, from Potter Park Zoo at the Animal Health Program. It's going to be epic. You're going to get to hear interviewees from the Sci-Files give updates on their episodes, such as the doctors and zookeepers of the black rhinos. It's almost been a year of the Sci-Files. To celebrate the anniversary, we will be giving out prizes, too. See you at the grid on March 14th, also known as Pi Day.